Today we make the piano. So uh, a version of this piano app that doesn't have any kind of fancy components like um, the virtual reality or, or whatever uh, camera input, but the simple piano that you can play using your mouse and pressing some kind of buttons on the screen. And that's why we start with our button system that we did uh, last time, and I'm going to polish it a little bit, um, extend it a little bit so that it maybe looks looks nicer, and to demonstrate that it works with any kind of shape of buttons, not just these rectangles. And then uh, we will practice generating sound, generating some kind of noise programmatically that sounds a little bit like a piano key being pressed. So let's begin by checking this code a little bit and um, remembering how this button system works and making it a little bit better by adding animations. So now we are able to detect these buttons on the canvas here somewhat when the mouse is moving over them. And I also added a simple uh, alert in the code. This was not actually part of the lecture we did last time, but uh, it is very simple line of code here detected on mouse, on mouse down. Uh, last time there was just a uh, printing in the console. So I pretty much replaced the console logging with this thing. So um, let's remember how this button system worked. So we have a canvas where we are drawing the buttons. This is what you see on the left here. And uh, we also have a secondary canvas which I now scaled a little bit down. Um, so it's not as big as what we had previously uh, because it fits better on the screen. So I, I want to keep it smaller there. And just for reference, that reminds us how the button system works. We also saw last time that we don't actually need to have this canvas visible or part of the uh, document object model part of the HTML itself. It could be just in memory, but I keep it here for learning purposes. Then the button handler that we made um, has a static method here, create a button. The button will have a label there, a name, and a location a width, a height. And this is actually one thing that is stupid here the color, this kind of color key that we implemented for the hit test uh, is something that you shouldn't need to worry about as an end user of our button API, if you call it. So this thing is not supposed to be here. It's, um, it's confusing. Why do I need to define a color key for a button when I don't see anything. So think about it. This is actually part of the manager of the uh, button handler of this black box, and it should decide the color keys itself, not somebody who just wants to add buttons to the stage. So here, instead of uh, passing this color attribute to the button that we are creating, I'm going to, um, okay, something is not working properly with my mouse and uh, keyboard. Maybe now it's better. I'm going to pass this uh, inside here instead and uh, now our main function just has create a button and with height. These are normal properties that the user expects to have. And OK, something is definitely wrong with my mouse and my keyboard. There is some kind of lag in transmitting the signal. And I changed the batteries just this morning, so I'm 
I'm not sure if. Let's see. Maybe. Maybe now it's better. Okay. And uh, adding event listeners. So this event listeners that we are adding here are for mouse down and mouse move. And uh, that's how we are detecting the click and we are making the cursor change to a pointer when hovering over the over one specific button. So what I want to do first is uh, add a little bit more uh, animation to the buttons, like have it look different when I have a hover state. And um, also I want to illustrate somehow that this hit test is being used to detect the, um, um, the cursor location. So I'm going to create here simple animation. Um, we did this last time. I'm going to call the function animate. And um, well, we didn't do this last time, but in the past. Using request animation frame, you can also use uh, set interval if that's what you want. And um, here I want to actually draw the buttons. So I want to draw the buttons at every frame. Uh, and possibly more things. So let's create a new function here. Given a context, it's going to, at the moment, just draw these buttons. And uh, the context is one coming from the canvas. Uh, wow, okay, my keyboard is doing something really stupid. I hope this is not going to bother me too much. Yeah. Um, OK, and before drawing the buttons, I should also clear the canvas. Act. Otherwise, the buttons are just going to be drawn on top of each other. And if they move for some reason or, or something, then that's not going to look good. So let's have here clear rect. We did this many times. So removing first the previous previous buttons. And if I refresh the page now, okay, let's also remove this um, overlay because I don't want to click on it every time then this works pretty much as before, but now it updates many times per second, so we see nothing because nothing is, is moving, but we will do some things soon enough. First, uh, I want to show on this hit uh, test canvas where our mouse location is, so let's try to OK, let's try first to. I'm going to restructure this a little bit, move, move this hit context above here, and I can reuse it in this uh, method here. Um, but before that, this should also have a clear rect on the hit canvas. So now I'm drawing on two canvases at, at the same time, basically. And uh, after I draw the button hit areas on the hit test canvas, and I also draw this title there called hit test on the top of the canvas, let's make a simple circle where the cursor is. So begin, oh my God. Yeah, I don't think I can do anything about this. So. Hmm. Yeah, 
then I use the arc method and um, I will need the location of the mouse to be able to to draw it somewhere. So let's call it for now mouse um, x location one location. I mean uh, y y location and give it a radius say 10% of the of the canvas size and a full circle. So starting at zero degrees and um, two pi, uh, the uh, radians, which means 360 degrees. And uh, hit context stroke. This should do it. But I don't know this mouse location, so if I want to have access to it, I need to store it somewhere uh, as the mouse is moving here on mouse move. And I could use, for example, a static uh, static variable here, mouse, which I have to update also here, and this is going to be here, part of this class. So um, our mouse location is going to be by default maybe the zero zero. And then as our mouse is moving, um, I'm updating that variable. And when drawing the buttons, I'm not just drawing the hit tests, but I'm also indicating where on the hit canvas um, the color is coming from with this kind of arc here. I probably need to say button handler mouse and other hand, button handler mouse as well because it's part of the class. Let's see. Okay, so you can see something now, but this um, arc is very thin, so let's give it a line width of say four. Okay, now it's a little better and let's make it smaller. So this is your 10% uh, is very, very much of the canvas size. So let's give it, uh, let's make it 4%. Okay, so now you know uh, where the color is being taken from, basically from the middle of that circle that is now moving on the hit test canvas at the same time as I'm moving my mouse uh, cursor on the real canvas. So it explains a little better how the whole system is working. I just did this to, to explain, not really to add more functionality into the system. But to add more functionality to the system, I want now the buttons to display differently if they are being hovered. So let's control here. Let's uh, keep in mind what is the state of this button. So uh, hover, and I'm going to initialize it with false in the beginning. And if we are going to be hovering a specific button here, I'm not just going to mod modify the cursor of the mouse to look like a pointer, but I'm also going to change the state of that button to true, the hover state of that button to true. So first, let me just get the reference for that button that I am hovering. and use this reference in this if statement um, instead of doing it again. And now I can say hover equals to true. So simple as that. And in our button, we can say here when we choose the field style of white, that if this hover, wow, I think I can manage with this, but uh, I have to figure out why is this happening. It's so sometimes the keyboard and the mouse get stuck and they are stuck for like one second 
with whatever key or whatever action I did last time. And it seems to happen periodically and I have no control over it, even if I change the USB ports or I, I just have to live with it, I think. So if this is hovering here, uh, let's make it gray uh, to, to show it a different color for now. And um, we have an error. So let's see what the error is. Um, I have an extra closing bracket here. So this is probably the error. OK. So now when I'm hovering over button two, it becomes gray. Um, it should become back white again when I'm not hovering it. So this is something that we need to still do. And testing button one also works. But before we uh, do this kind of um, toggling the hover to, to true here, we also need to reset the hover states of all other buttons. So let's say something like um, maybe something like this. So what this will do is, wow, what this will do is uh, set the hover for all buttons in the scene to false. And then here, if we are indeed hovering over a button, because we might just be also on the background, um, if we are hovering over a button, that specific button is going to be set to true. Otherwise, nothing is set to true. So we are not hovering over all buttons. All will appear to be white, basically. So I need this method also part of this, this class now. A question? Yes. Uh, could you put it in the else part? Button hover falls. Yes. Um, let me see. No, I, I think not because um, OK, I will demonstrate why I cannot do that. Just a second. OK. Mm -hmm. My keyboard is sometimes doing worse than other times. I'm going to copy this uh, for loop from here. So iterating through all the buttons and um, taking each button and putting its hover state to false. Now, resetting the hover states. Um, just let's see if it works first. So it works as expected. The reason why I don't put it in the else, and just to demonstrate, I think that now it works with no problems. So let's, let's try it. Yeah, so this works with, with no problems, but if I take button one or button two, it doesn't matter. And I move him closer to the other one. Like this. OK, now they're overlapping, but I think you get the point. If my mouse is over button two and then I'm moving it over button one, it's always hovering something. So that else uh, statement is actually never happening when I have a transition from one button to the next. And this reset hover states never affected the button that was um, on top. If I put these to all buttons, then as I move, um, as I move from this one to the other one, uh, it will work because it, um, it, even though my mouse was always hovering some button, 
the ones that it's not hovering anymore are being uh, reset to um, to hover equals false here. So actually, very good question because uh, usually if else statements should work like that. But in this case, it could cause a bug sometimes if your mm, application doesn't have buttons which are close to each other then this is not so problematic. Okay, thank you. I understand better. Yeah, and even if the buttons are actually far from each other, if you move your mouse quickly from one to the other, the same issue could appear because the mouse locations are discrete and, uh, well, it could jump from one button to the other. And yeah, so I, I think it's it's better to consider this this way. OK, now um, I'm defining a button here in the interface and it's it's really it's simple. I mean, it's the name, the location, the width and height, but I want to give this button something to do when I press it. So let's try to do something here. I'm going to have a function called. Play note. This is going to be a function that uh, is going to play a note with a given frequency. So now I'm talking about musical notes, piano notes that we will later have. So I could pass it this um, play note uh, as a parameter, but I'm going to wrap this into an object and say that the callback function is going to be play note. Let me align this a little better. So the callback function is going to be play note and the frequency is going to be, let's say, something like 400. So basically, I don't say just play note because I want this button to contain more properties like which note to play. And uh, I'm going to also copy this for the second button and uh, the same callback function is going to be called this one here, but let's change the frequency to 300. And for now, I'm going to console log this um, frequency just to see that we are getting it uh, when we are pressing the buttons. Now, um, here we have mouse down, we have unmouse down, blah, blah, blah. If we have a button, I have this silly alert here that a button name was pressed. I want to essentially call the callback function. So this is going to be something like um, button dot click, a method that we we have to implement now. So let's let's see how this would look like here. Um, after we have our color parameter, we are going to get those other options like which is the callback function, uh, what is the frequency or whatever other data you want to give to this button to to encapsulate. We are just sending it as additional options now and they are um, they are going to be wrapping the function to call and the parameter for that the argument for that function. So I'm saving also this one. And I need um, a method for click. I already called it previously. This one is going to take from the options. So this options, it's going to take the callback function, whatever I press, so whatever I pass. So in our case, it will be that play note and it's going to call it with the frequency value. I don't know if this is very confusing, but uh, you can think about it and prepare question while I'm writing this. So these options is going to be this. It's going to contain 
a function to call and a frequency value. That's that's it basically. And uh, in the create function, in the create button function, I still need to pass these options to the button constructor here. So something like this. And I think that that's pretty much it. No, we have some errors. Oh, I did something stupid here. I don't think I did something stupid, but uh, I think my keyboard did something stupid while I was not watching. OK, so what you see now in this. Um, in this console is the frequency of the button that I am that I am clicking because of this click method part of the button object, which is calling the given callback function. So I, I basically separate and allow you to use my button system with any function you you want to give as the callback. And if you want to give to that callback function an, an uh, argument, then you can. So it's pretty much a general general system here. OK, let's also work a little bit more on how the buttons look like. So now that we can click them, maybe we want to draw them um, with a down state. So similar as the hover, I just repeat this. Hopefully it becomes a little bit more clear. So we change the state to true when we are clicking. And um, let's say if this down, let's make it some other color. Be red. So now the button is going to be red when we are clicking it. It's going to be gray when we are hovering it. And um, we have the same issue as before. Um, reset. The reset state here is something that needs to be considered. So basically, if I don't do this, then once I click my button, it's going to be down and it's going to be down forever. So um, when do you want it to be reset? Is when your mouse is up, right? So we have here um, different event listeners. We have the event listener for mouse down. We have event listener for mouse move. So we need to have event listener for mouse up and create a method for that. I'm going to copy this unmouse down method and um, have an unmouse up. And at the moment we don't do anything here on mouse up, but reset the um, the states. So I'm just going to copy this code for resetting the hover state and um, put the down state to false. So the down state is false for all the buttons um, when you have the mouse up event clicked. So it could be a little bit confusing, but if you think about it, no matter what button you have pressed, um, when you do a mouse up, you cannot press any button. So it's OK to just target all of these. You could keep in memory which button was pressed or something like that. It's OK. It could be part of the functionality of your button handler, but I I make it like this for, for simplicity. Note that all this code that we are writing here, part of the button handler, is something that um, normal users that, that want to use the button handler later don't have to worry about. So this all this logic 
is something that you can tailor and make as you as you want it to be, and others won't have to to know how it works really. Okay, so the hover state is there. Uh, this is now me holding down the button and releasing the button. So it seems to work just as 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 expected. Okay. Now, um, let's make them look a little bit more like a piano. So let's start to think about how the piano should look like. I'm going to use the main keys. I, I'm not the music expert. I don't know anything actually about pianos and, and music. I just know the notes like this, do, re, mi, uh, whatever. So I'm going to work based on that. Um, and I'm going to actually create a new object for a piano key. So our button handler now works with this with this button object. I'm going to rename this object as rectangle <coughs> button. And I'm going to implement a new button uh, style that looks more like a piano key. So let's see how we do that. I'm going to write here a new class, piano key button. And I want to use class inheritance here, even though it's it probably should be implemented a little different, but I think it's good to for you to know that JavaScript does support inheritance as, as one of the features. So I'm going to extend um, extends, I think it's the syntax. Yes, extends rectangle button. And this just means that whatever the rectangle button has here written in the constructor, in the click, um, like this down state, this uh, callback, whatever, it's implemented part of the piano key button as well. What I want to make different is the drawing function, the drawing and the hit test um, areas, which will look a little bit nicer. So I want to experiment different shapes than just a rectangle uh, shape to see if my hit test is really worth it. Now, uh, constructor needs to be defined here as well, I think. I'm not 100% sure, but um, you can use the super keyword. So if you are familiar with other programming languages, then this super just means that it takes the constructor from this super class and calls it with whatever parameters are, are here. And I don't need to do anything about the click method because it's going to be the same. Uh, piano key is also going to be pressed and it will also have a, a function there uh, to be called the callback function. But I am going to implement specifically uh, tailored methods here, which essentially overrides the methods from the rectangle button. And instead of doing the rect here, I'm going to draw the buttons uh, almost as a rectangle, but in the bottom I'm going to have it have uh, an arc. So it looks kind of like, um, like a round rectangle on the bottom part of the, of the button. And then we can test to see if this hit test based on the color is, is working and is more complicated. Um, more complicated shapes. And I think it looks nicer. It's like um, a bit less boring than the, than the rectangle buttons. So, yeah. OK, so how do we do that? I'm going to comment out this rect method, and I'm going to just use simple methods like um, move to. I'm going to move to the top left corner of where the button is going to be drawn. And then I'm going to do a line. 
mm, my line is going to go down. So from this top left corner, I'm going to go now to the bottom left corner. And then I'm going to draw my arc. So, or, okay, let's, let's first uh, make it still a rectangle at the moment to see if my, my code works. Mm. Just a second, this will become clear, I think. And, 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 and probably close path. So drawing a line from the top left corner to the bottom left corner, to the bottom right corner, to the top right corner, and closing the path. So this, if I, um, if I switch now to create piano keys, Here, create piano key, and instead of rectangle button, I'm gonna have my piano key button. Then let's just modify um, one of these to see to see the difference. So we have now create button here and create piano key here. And if I refresh, I think as if I didn't make any kind of mistakes. Okay, it looks like this. Um, this rectangle button may need to be defined before the other one. I'm not sure about these language specific things. OK, so at the moment both actually look the same, but uh, now I'm going to add that arc to the um, to the piano key button. So to make it to make it look different. And I think I need to add arc just here. So my arc is going to be centered in the middle of the button. So that's where my center point is, where the radius starts. And the radius is going to be I think it should be the oh wait. So first I need the center point, then I need the I mean the x-axis point, now I need the y-axis point. So this is gonna be this height divided by two. And then the radius. This is gonna be half the width. So half the width of my button. And uh, I want just a half circle this time. So from zero to math pi is going to be enough. Let's see what happens now. <laughs> OK, so button B is a piano key button, but button one is, um, is a rectangle button. Now, if I try to hover button B here, it's not going to activate because you see there on the hit test canvas, it still appears as a rectangle. But if I go over the hit test where I want it to, to uh, activate, where it says it should activate, it does work. So to get this to work properly, I just copy this um, inside the draw hit area instead of the rect method here. And I think that we are done. So now you can actually see the um, pixel perfect hit detection working nicely uh, on different shapes of buttons. So it's, yeah. And because we are passing these callback functions and uh, using inheritance from the piano key button to the um, rectangle button, I actually get the play note um, function 
executing here as well with the given frequencies. So again, I'm doing some things here slowly and refactoring at the same time. Uh, this could have been done all in one all in one shot, but I think that the goal is to teach you that okay, it is possible to use this inheritance if you want to use, and some of the code will not be need to be rewritten. To make it proper, like really proper, you could consider a parent class called just button. And then this rectangle button inherits from that and makes it look like a rectangle. The piano key, circle button, or whatever buttons you want could inherit from this one superclass. But here I'm I'm doing it a little bit sloppy and overwriting these, these methods there. But just to make the point that it is possible to do this and you can save a lot of um, time and uh, make the code less and, and clearer by doing this. All right, but now I don't want to create these type of buttons anymore. I'm going to keep the code because it shows that it is possible to create simple looking buttons too. And let's make our scale. So let's have dough and um, this is going to be more thin button. So with 100 height, 200 and um, let's start it somewhere close to the left side of the screen. So maybe 10% from the left of the, of the screen. And I'm going to copy this like Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si, Do. And um, of course, I don't want them to be overlapping each other, so I'm going to offset them a little bit here. Um, probably this is going to be good enough. Yeah, let's see what we have here. Uh, refresh the page and, uh, well, some things look bad. Like the size of the text in my button. Now, if you really want to make a good button handler, then you have to consider um, that the text should maybe get smaller if your button is thin like this. But um, I'm not going to spend more time on, on polishing it. I'm just going to um, make the size of the text here smaller. I could make this smaller value here, or I could use the width instead of the height, because now the width is, uh, is the smaller value. Let's see how this looks like. OK, I'm happy with this. Um, I would like the buttons, the piano keys, to be a little bit centered, so I calculated wrong here. I should probably offset by 5% everything, and I think it will look centered. So you notice now that there is a little bit more spacing here than here. I just want it to be, to be centered properly. And maybe let's put it also a little bit to the bottom part of the screen because I'm going to add some other stuff to the top. So, so let's make it at 70% of the screen height. So 30% from the bottom, basically. OK. And each of these have now frequency 300. So this is something that uh, needs to change. Um, and I don't know what these frequencies are, so uh, I find them somewhere. And I already found them on some page. Basically, each, so each sound, each uh, musical note has a frequency a different frequency. And 
that's what makes them sound different, essentially. I'm going to link this site what, that explains this. I actually haven't looked on this site, to be honest. Um, OK, sometimes my keyboard doesn't copy because that thing happens when I copy. So. Yeah, anyway, um, I haven't read this, but I did find immediately what I was looking for. Uh, this is essentially the and this is the upper dough. So this is, I think it's called, I forget how it's called, but it's like a, this main scale. And you can also use letters to define it. And I, I know that little bit about music. <laughs> and these are the things that I need to add here. So these specific frequencies are going to be copied for each of the notes, and those are going to make what we do sound different when we click on the different buttons. Of course, if you want to make a big piano with more keys, it's possible. Um, you have to find some other page that uh, has the frequency values for all the keys. It's definitely uh, available. Uh, I mean, common knowledge, not some kind of secret or, or anything. And now when I'm clicking these, um, you can see here that the values are different. But there is no sound. So that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to programmatically implement, um, implement sound, sound in the system. And I'm going to make that play note uh, function here, um, generate that noise into the speaker, into our my speaker, which hopefully you can hear if I configured it correctly. So let's try to do that. To generate sound, you need uh, something called an audio context. This is a object that is again part of modern HTML and modern browsers. And I'm going to reference it here as a global variable. But I'm going to define it in my play note um, function. And I will explain why I'm doing this in a second. I'm doing this because I mean the reason why I'm not doing the reason why I'm not doing this already in the top part is because for this to work, the browser actually needs the user to click on it first. So it's it's something weird, but um, Basically, I, I think it has to do with some security thing. You don't want um, web pages to start noise without the user interacting with it first. So if you try to do this on the top part, uh, it's going to say uh, interact with the canvas first, otherwise sound is not appearing there. So because display note is being called after you click one of our buttons, um, I have clicked on something. And that's why I'm defining it here. Mm. And um, to make it work on multiple browsers, I found that um, I should actually um, specify here also these things. Basically, oh boy. Each browser has its own place. Its own place where this audio context exists. And if you want to support like Firefox and Safari, I think you need to have all of these three things here. OK, then once we have this object, we can create something called an oscillator. 
So this oscillator object, it's going to be kind of like a mathematical wave function, like a sine wave, for example, something that oscillates, something that is periodical. And this is essentially what simple sounds are. They are mathematical functions that are periodical in nature and have some kind of wave-like wave -like pattern. So this oscillator, we can get it with audio, audio. create oscillator. And um, we need to start this oscillator, stop this oscillator and connect it to our um, destination, which is the speakers. So this is something that uh, I will try to explain. Uh, I made this figure here. So at the moment, uh, this oscillator needs to be connected to something where we can hear it. And that is the, that is the destination from this audio context. Um, as we are going to add more things, this type of chart, is go, this kind of diagram is going to get a bit more complicated, but uh, we start with this simplest possible um, variant. So let's see. Um, I'm going to say mm, Connect to the destination, but also I need to start this oscillator and I'm going to start it immediately uh, when I pressed this mm, the button and when this function is called. So this is going to be current time. And I want this to stop after some time. So usually when you press a key on a piano, it lasts for a couple of seconds and then the noise is gone. So I'm going to say stop uh, current time plus, uh, let's say a duration. So this is going to be, I could keep it here as a, as a local variable or I could, consider this uh, parameter to display note, then I, I, yeah, it doesn't matter. But for at the moment, what this means is that um, sound will stop in two seconds. OK, so a little bit of code here, but uh, are we done? Let me think. So connected to destination, it starts and it's told when to stop. I think this should work. Let's let's try it out and I hope that you will be able to hear something if my setup is good. Mm -hmm. Okay. How bothering was that? How disturbing was that? Because for me it was horrible. Uh, tell me. Did you hear anything? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't. <laughs> OK, I heard, so I need to figure out how to. How to set this up so that you hear something. Of course, one way would be for me to take my headset off and then I have the noise in the room. But how could I make teams? Share also the audio, I think this should be possible. Device settings, maybe. Yeah, no. Usually, when I share the screen in Teams, it asks me if I want to share the computer audio also, but Hmm. 
Yeah, I'm not sure how to do this. And I don't want to turn, take the headset off because it could actually be disturbing to neighbors. <laughs> so we are doing some, some strange things here. Uh, just, just a second, I want to, if somebody knows how to do this, so I want to... Uh -huh. mm, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, so now the other thing is... Okay, I I don't think it works. Maybe you can try resharing. Okay, yeah, let me try that. Okay, uh, I think it will work now. Can you still hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, I think it works. There was also another button. It disappeared very quickly on the top, but I pressed it before it went away and it said include system audio. So I hope this is not going to disturb everybody too much. Uh, I'm pressing it now. Okay. How disturbing was that from one to ten? Four, uh, four. Three, 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 three. Okay, uh, Ilpo. It is okay. It is okay. Really? Okay. I will anyway um, make it a little less loud because for me it was horrible. So now I will teach you how to add a new node into this audio context, which is going to control the gain. The gain is essentially almost the same as the volume. It controls the amplitude of the, of the sound wave. <laughs> and uh, I want to basically have a, a lower volume in my ear here. So let's see how, how we do that. Uh, we create something called a gain node. Create gain. And we are going to set its value using this method. I'm going to set its value to 0. Point, let's say 0. 0.6, so 60% of the volume that we heard previously. And at time just means that I want to have this value already in the beginning of playing if I put here um, the same audio context. Wow. Current time. So this is now going to control the gain, the volume, pretty much. And um, <clears throat> I need to connect now my gain to um, to the destination. And the oscillator, I need to connect it to the gain. So this is what you see here on the right now that basically after the modifying the gain, this output needs to go to the destination. So that's how this kind of system works. And you will see that we will do a bit more sophisticated things here. But let's see if this now works. Should it be, be a note? A note? Yes, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and here. Hmm. It's a bit better, at least to me, uh, but just to make sure that it affects, I'm going to put some very low value here. Yeah, so it definitely it definitely affects. I'm going to use this if it's all right with you guys. OK. Now, uh, I want to do something fun. <laughs> this is visual web development, so I'm going to visualize how the sound looks like. I'm going to basically show you um, the sound waveform as we are playing it, and I'm going to animate it on the canvas as we are hearing it. For that, uh, I'm going to use a code that is uh, I found online because I don't remember all the all the details from here. Um, but uh, I will explain what it does. So let me see. I have this link somewhere. Or no, I don't remember the link anymore. Um, OK, I just have to find it somehow. I think I can use some keywords like. Um, I hope it was this link. Yeah, um, so this code here actually draws whatever information comes from the um, from the um, sound system as a waveform. And I'm going to try to replicate this, but I will keep whatever is is the most important component. The most important is this uh, a new analyzer node. So this node is going to be added here after the game. Uh, and it will be used to take the data, the raw data from the sound signal. And I'm going to use that to display the result on the canvas. So I'm going to use part of this code now and try to uh, implement, implement pretty much the same, the same functionality in our own system. So bear with me for a little bit. Um, I'm going to use a global for this analyzer. Uh, yeah, and this analyzer, I need to create it, and I can create it once when I initialize the audio context, I think. So basically, Create analyzer. I can add that here. I think this is OK for now. Yeah, and here when I'm connecting the gain node to the audio context destination, I'm also going to connect it to the analyzer. So this is essentially saying that the gain node needs to go to my speakers here, but also to this mysterious analyzer thing that uh, the code on the right is um, transforming into a drawing on the canvas. So that's what I'm going to try to do now. Uh, adapt that code to work on our our canvas system. So um, in our draw scene function, I'm drawing the buttons here. This is just great. Uh, but I want to take the data from the analyzer. So if the analyzer exists, if it's not null, I'm going to take the data. Yeah, so let's keep names. This is a data structure, so you int 8 just means unsigned integer of 8 bits. So these values are going to be between 0 and uh, 
255, I, I think. So this is the raw data that the sound is is created from. And uh, here I just I don't think I need to use this buffer length because it's essentially the FFT size from there. Some of these things are confusing, so um, and I'm not going to explain everything here. This FFT uh, stands for fast Fourier transform. It's a transformation that you do on the raw raw data to get these kind of uh, meaningful meaningful patterns. Um, you will learn what it is by visualizing what we are doing here now. It's not so important to know about this in this course, and even I don't know it good enough to be able to teach it. So I'm just using it. And uh, this actually is, uh, this line here doesn't define anything. It just makes an empty array, essentially. To populate it, I need to use the analyzer I defined earlier and say get byte time domain data. So this method populates the data array given here as a parameter. So essentially, empty value here, now it gets whatever the analyzer gives it. And now we draw this data. So this is going to be one array of values, and I want to draw these values as a function. So it's going to have values like 0, 1, 10, whatever. If it's zero, it's going to be on the x-axis. If it's 10, it's going to be above it, and, and so on. So simple array of numbers that I want to scale and fit on my canvas somehow. And I'm going to use most of this code and adapt it a little bit. So let me just think how, how this goes. We have the context here. Mm, let's have also some thickness. I'm going to pretty much copy most of the things uh, because I think I remember they work really well. And it's part of this official, I think, Mozilla documentation here on this page. By the way, there are also some other links here to some nice, nice projects. You can check those out. Let me add here also the uh, place where I'm getting this from. Yeah. I think I'm going to change some things a little bit, but uh, it's pretty much the same code there. Maybe not re maybe not inventing some new variable names where they are not needed and, and things like that. So this is where I'm drawing the, the line itself, and I'm going to compute here x and y values. So the x starts at zero, and it's going to increase by this uh, slice width, as they call it. So yeah, basically the slice width is how how many how long this time window is uh, with respect to my canvas. So I'm normalizing it there. Um, at each step of this for loop, I increased this by uh, by the slice width, and eventually that means that from the left side of the canvas all the way to the right side of the canvas, uh, that's how this x is going to span. And then for the y values, okay, I'm gonna make a little bit different here. So normalizing these and yeah, I'm also going to scale it a little bit. I don't want it to be the full full size, so maybe 20%. You will get what I'm doing here in just a second, but um, you need to bear with me for a moment. And I will also log in the console how these things are looking like. 
to become more clear, but I can't really do it while I'm writing this code. So simple um, function, just line to pretty much everywhere except this move to which is going to happen first. So at first the uh, place where the drawing is happening is moved to the very first location, but all the others are lined to. So it's going to appear to be a curve, but it's made out of many, many small line segments, depending on this size of this fast Fourier transform window there. OK, I think that we are done if I didn't make any big mistakes. So fingers crossed. OK, so now I'm going to press this button. And nothing happened. OK. Let's debug. So. No, uh, I forgot to stroke it. No need to debug yet. Yay. <laughs> so. Something happened there. I don't know how well you see this because my PC is lagging a little bit and with the screen sharing and, and so on. But could you see a waveform on the top of the screen as on the top of the canvas yes, as I yes, was? I can see it. OK, great. Uh, it, 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 oh, oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was, yeah, somewhat, it was visible. somewhat visible. OK. OK, now. Um, that waveform depends actually pretty much on this um, parameter here, how it looks like. So this parameter um, value has, this parameter has a default value. I don't remember exactly how much it is, but we will figure it out now. Uh, wow, this is not my day. Um, but all these things are documented. So if you really want to learn something, you can always uh, learn these things by self-studying. So this FFT size, uh, it has values that must be a power of two. Um, I think the default is probably 2048. Uh, but we will, we can figure this out. Um, let's see what happens if we change it. So if it's a power of two, I prefer to write it in this notation. So two to some power, maybe uh, let's put 10 here and see how the visualizing um, looks like if we are changing this. Okay, not very uh, different. Let me try eight here. It's the same note, but the visualizing is different. Basically, the window that it's taking pictures from the data, it's being, um, its size is being altered by this. I'm going to put a bigger value, maybe. 13, and hopefully you understand a bit better what is happening. Not sure if you saw it, but the signal actually comes in like a train and then exits on the other side. Let's see if I can put even a bigger value. So it's stuck a little bit on my screen, but I hope you get the idea. I'm not changing the sound at all at this stage. Just the way it's visualized is uh, affected by this parameter here. I'm going to put a value, let's say 13 and, and stick with it for the rest. Yeah, OK, now. Um, what else? What did I say I do? 
I said that I can show you also how this array looks like. It's nothing special really. I could log it here, for example. So, so after it gets populated with the data from this get byte time domain data from the analyzer, I'm going to log it. And that means when I'm playing this, I'm going to get some huge array here. And you can see that the values are different values, seems to be between 0 and uh, 128, or I think it's possible. Yeah, it could be between 0 and 128, maybe. Yeah, so these values, I scale them to be able to plot on the canvas. Uh, 128 is what it's, it's something related uh, to the sound signal itself. So I'm scaling it. Uh, that's what happens here with these values. OK, but I removed this log. It's uh, slowing down my computer pretty much. And I hope my browser is not crashing now because of all this logging that is happening here. OK, seems to be seems to be fine now. So this was one uh, one note here, but actually I never set the um, frequency. So if we go back to my function that is used to play the note, I'm never setting this um, this frequency value um, inside of the oscillator. So the oscillator's frequency is going to need to be set somewhere. And I'm going to say set it like this. Oscillator frequency value is equal to whatever the button tells the frequency should be. Um, if I don't do that, you hear some default frequency. Maybe it's 400 hertz or, or something, whatever the value was that you were hearing so far. But now, Seconds yeah, that's what we are going to work with now. So I'm not sure if you could hear. There is a click in the beginning and a click in the end. Something that I don't like and I want to avoid as much as possible. Uh, I'm going to do this by varying the gain from zero to the maximum value and back to zero. I hope you can follow me what happens here, but um, what I want to do here, but essentially I want to modify the gain as the sound is playing. So I want my piano noise to start quickly, but then slowly fade away. And after the two seconds, after one second has passed, it's already going to be barely uh, noticeable, but I want to make it sound like a piano, not like this annoying beeping noise. So this is what I'm going to do now. Uh, to do that, I'm going to say um, I use a method here called linear ramp to value at time. Basically, I want to start my gain at zero. Then I want it to go to one, which is 100%. Um, well, OK, I will teach you something else here too. Uh, a master volume. So there is some, OK, let's put it back to 0 0.6. So 60%, that was our value we previously, previously used here. So I wanted to go to 60% um, quickly after our start. So after the current time plus, let's say, uh, a fraction of a second, so a very, very small value. So our 
volume is going to somehow raise immediately. Um, okay, to illustrate it properly, let's put, he, put it here that it starts at zero, then it's going to be 60% after one second and uh, zero again after two seconds. So what this does is actually a, a more sophisticated set interval or um, however you want to call it that works on the signal itself and it's not going to have some choppy effects to it. So it uh, it changes the gain value from 0 to 0 0.6 in a linear way. Uh, let's see how this affects. So I'm going to press now the first key. So you can see you can see visually what has happened uh, to the gain. Basically, the amplitude of those waves starts off small. It gets to 60 percent and then goes back down to zero. This is visually what has happened, and it will affect all the it will affect all the notes that we are generating here. Uh, there are some other methods that are quite useful here. For example, there is an exponential um, variant, which instead of increasing it linearly, so it gradually goes up and down, it will have a different um, a different trend there. I also think it will give you an error unless you use here some uh, value very close to zero. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you don't need to worry about these things. So I, I think the linear is enough. But uh, to make it sound more like the piano, I want the sound to start off uh, instantly. So this kind of going gradually, it takes too long. So that's why I want to put here a very, very small value, as I mentioned previously. And this is going to make my note instantly go up and then slowly down and there is no click in the beginning or the end because I'm starting it at the zero value. The click comes because of how the the wave function starts and ends. So it's a difference from nothing to something and that one forms a click. So this is a bit of mathematics here, uh, but you can do very many, very many interesting things with these functions. For example, you can even use them to control the frequency if you want. So if you do, for example, here, if you take the oscillator frequency instead of the gain and say, make it be the given frequency plus some value, let's say 100, then my frequency is going to actually change as the sound is playing. Uh, let's see if it works. I think these things should work. So I'm not sure if you hear it, but um, it changed the, the way that the sound sounds like. It, it changed as the note was going, not just the volume getting different, but uh, its, um, its frequency has, has varied. So basically the closeness of those waves is, is changing if I want, but that's not how a piano works. So other thing, other properties that we can change is the shape of the oscillator. So by default, the shape is a sine function, but there are others as well. Uh, you can Google if you want to see different ones. Um, there is triangle, for example, which I think works really well for for the piano noise, it makes it a little bit more melodious somehow. Um, let's see. There are also a couple of others and you can even specify your own custom type here. So really very much freedom. Okay. Mm.
So maybe you are right. And I think that this two second sound is is probably too much. Maybe we make the duration smaller and let's add it here as well as instead of this hard coded variable value. Okay, um, there is something that I still want to fix. I'm not sure if you notice, but um, if I'm pressing multiple, multiple notes really quickly to each other, the amplitude, the cumulative amplitude exceeds one. So, okay. It, this sounds horrible for me. My volume is really loud, but I'm going to try to press three of them quickly and you will see that the, the graph exceeds the top of the window here. When that happens, the noise is a little bit choppy. Mm, not sure if you if you got it, but to me, because I hear it louder, it, it really sounds quite bad. So um, you could reduce that effect by setting here a lower, lower gain for each note, because now even if you press multiple keys and they accumulate on top of each other, it's harder for them to escape the maximum value of 100%. Of so you could do it like this, or you could implement what I want to do as the final thing, uh, a master gain. So like a master volume, essentially. Uh, I'm going to define this here and say mm, that I, I created at the moment that I'm creating the context and the analyzer. And um, I can also connect it now to the destination. So this is going to be, I have a figure here. If you have multiple clicks, like one oscillator for one key, one oscillator for another, they each will have their own gain, like going up and down and this kind of more pleasant sound like a piano key but then both of them are going to be controlled by this master gain. This is nice to have in a game, for example, that you have multiple effects coming on, but there is something that lowers all of them, uh, like a master, master control there. So you may have sound effects to be loud, but background music to be low. Maybe you want to control those individually, but you want the master volume to be still accessible from somewhere. So that's what I'm I'm going to try to do here. Uh, I need to connect it to this destination. Wow. And I think I, yeah, I should also connect it to the analyzer. So this is like what you see here. Um, and I can set its value. So I can set its value similar to what I was setting here previously for the game node. And let's set it to, let's say 0 0.3. Yeah. And um, here I'm not going to connect this game uh, game node to the analyzer. It's not needed anymore because now um, the main gain, the master gain is going to be connected to the analyzer. So analyzer gets the information. Uh, I'm going to put here the master gain instead. And um, I don't even need to connect this to the destination anymore because this just connects to this and this one connects to the destination here. I hope that this works because I did it quite quickly. But um, yeah, and I don't need this log for the frequency anymore. 
Let's see if it works. Hopefully final test. Yeah, okay, I think it works. Um, now I can put here maximum value if I want. So each of my gains, like the two individual gains here can be 100%. It's, it's okay because I can control the output uh, to this 30% coming from the master gain. So because um, now when I was testing, this is reduced to 20% and this is reduced to that to 30% it becomes reduced by cumulatively and it's it's uh, too low the the volume essentially so leaving 100% here i don't have to worry about them individually being too loud uh, and the overall volume is set by this master gain here I think that's it. Uh, hope it wasn't too confusing. My keyboard was really messed up and um, I hope you find this useful because um, I do. I think that it gives control over the sound that you're playing, the duration, um, this kind of gain. You can do pretty much anything you want with it. If you want to study more about it, you can start uh, study this uh, ADSR envelope. It's useful. I'll put a link to that. I think this coding train channel has a video on it, if I remember right. You can control anything you want. You can control the pitch, this uh, this frequency. There are even more attributes, uh, properties that you could handle here. I didn't even talk anything about uh, filters. You can apply filters on these on these sounds to make some really, really weird things. Um, and I have here one simple effect. It's actually, well, a simple page where I did something uh, a long time ago. I have this weird uh, Dragon Ball related uh, video on my channel and I made this uh, Kamehameha effect uh, visually and also uh, audio, the audio part of that. Uh, so that effect that I made is using the same kind of techniques as here, but uh, also some filters and a bit more advanced stuff. And basically this is done using the audio context. It sounds a little weird. I hope it doesn't didn't bother anybody. But um, uh, essentially, you can make really complicated like effects, or you can add more frequencies, and uh, you can pretty much play a song if you know the notes for that song, like that kind of music box. So it's also possible to do that. You can see here frequencies just being played automatically at given time intervals now. So that's it. If you have questions, you can ask, but um, you will need to do things in your exercise, combining visual and audio input for next time. Any questions? OK, if no questions, then I hope this was clear and not too confusing. I think the code is.